We'll now welcome our second panel. Our witnesses are Mr. Rick Taylor, President, Facility Operations, Renovations, and Construction, Balfour Beatty Communities, Mr. Heath Burleson, Corvius Partnership Advisor, Mr. Dennis Hickey, CEO of Lead Lease Americas, Mr. John Ali, President of Hunt Military Communities, and, excuse me, Mr. John Ale, um, and Mr. Jeff Guild, Vice President, Lincoln Military Housing. The witnesses will provide testimony on their efforts to improve the conditions in privatized military family housing and answer questions about how we could have had the problems that have surmounted over the last number of years in the first place. In addition, they will provide details on their ongoing actions to remedy the inadequate management of the program, improvements they have already instituted, and longer-term longer process improvements that will be implemented in the coming months. Mr. Taylor, we'll start with you, and then we'll go down the table. Um, uh, all of the witnesses' full written testimony will be entered into the record, and each of you will be recognized for three minutes and your, uh, to summarize your remarks. So, Mr. Taylor, we'll start with you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairwoman Washington Schultz, Ranking Member Carter, distinguished members of the subcommittee. My name is Rick Taylor, and I am co-president of Balfour Beatty Communities. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We are committed to providing our nation's servicemen and women and their families safe, quality, and responsive professional property management. We have been actively participating in the meetings with the Department of Defense to help implement the MHPI provisions under the FY20 NDAA, and we support the Tenant Bill of Rights and pledge to continue to work with DOD to develop uniform policies regarding these matters. In addition to the reforms outlined in the NDAA, we are actively exploring innovative ways to enhance the long-term financial vi viability of the MHPI, including OMB scoring of new projects and project refinancing, leveraging reinvestment account deposits, and basic allowance for housing rate stabilization. As a company, we have learned a lot and we are committing to making things right. I would like to highlight some of the changes we have implemented to enhance our operations and our residents' daily living experience. First, we have reorganized. This includes my appointment as co-president and with specific responsibility for facility operations, renovations, and construction. As a former Navy Civil Engineer Corps officer, I am especially sensitive to the types of challenges and concerns associated with military housing, and I am fully committed to providing and implementing solutions. We have also recently appointed a Senior Vice President of Transformation. He is tasked to lead a review of our operating procedures and put in place a comprehensive change management program. Second, we have radically adjusted our approach to maintenance and customer service to include the identification and management of environmental hazards. We've augmented our local teams by hiring third-party specialist contractors for HVAC, environmental remediation, and industrial hygiene. We have delivered exceptional customer service training to our employees to reemphasize our commitment to best practices and high standards. And we have delivered code of conduct training to our employees to underscore the importance we place on integrity and ethics. Finally, we have introduced a more robust performance metric tracking and reporting across our entire portfolio, including resident satisfaction, work orders, displaced residents, preventive maintenance, occupancy, and staffing levels. We are also empowering our residents by providing with greater transparency into and control over the work order process. These efforts are just the beginning. We acknowledge there is more to do, and our teams are continuing to collaborate with all stakeholders to deliver ongoing improvements. Our residents deserve the best, and we're committed to delivering for them. Thank you for your time. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Mr. Hickey? Chairwoman Wasserman Schultz, Ranking Member Carter, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, my name is Dennis Hickey. I'm CEO of Lend Lease America. Look, Lend Lease is proud to be working with the Department of Defense and the key committees of Congress and also the military families. Madam Chairwoman, the issues being discussed here today are critical for Lend Lease and for me personally. No family, much less a military family, should live in substandard conditions. We have the privilege of overseeing 40,000 homes with 132,000 residents across 28 installations in the US. And we welcome the support that Congress has given over the past 12 months to try and improve the military uh, housing initiative. There are many efforts that have been set by Congress that are underway. Uh, one of those efforts involved the NDA reforms, and we at Lend Lease are committed to in implementing all of those reforms as outlined in the NDA language. Another important military housing initiative actually came from this very committee, which is the uh, appropriation of $140 million for new housing inspectors. This will no doubt go a long way to seeing the oversight as requested under the NDA language. 
Madam Chairman, we are proud of the work we do at Lendlease, but realise that we can and must do more. For example, Lendlease currently processes over 400,000 service orders a year across our bases. Our statistics show that 97% of these service orders are completed in time and within resident satisfaction. However, 3% of these are obviously not. And it's that 3% that I am particularly focused upon. Our goal is to improve all aspects of our operation and to ensure that the families can, can live in safe and affordable housing. To do that over the past 12 months, we've taken a number of steps. Firstly, we've revolutionised our customer service. We've added new staff, new suppliers, contractors, instituted trading programs across all of our maintenance people to, to improve their skills. Secondly, we've been the first to implement a far smartphone app more than two years ago that perfecting uh, this is still an ongoing requirement for our team. It contains easy information for our residents and gives them easy access to log complaints and log requests. Thirdly, we're working with material companies to better install new uh, preventative methods across all of our housing product. And fourthly, we're investing in digital technology that can better analyse data analytics and get to preventative maintenance issues. And finally, Madam Chair, well, I am particularly proud of the implementation of new residence advisory boards across all of our military bases. These boards are set up in such that each village has a representative for circa three to 400 homes. That representative is elected by those three or 400 people. Across the base, those representatives then come together to form a residence board. And we, as Len Lease, along with the garrison, sit on that board. That board meets monthly, discusses the performance of the base, and also raises any key issues. That board uh, has been rolled out across all of our uh, installations as improving to be effective. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Hickey. Thank you. Mr. Burleson. Chairwoman Wasserman Schultz, Ranking Member Carter, and Subcommittee members, it is my privilege to provide testimony about the Military Housing Privatization Initiative. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. In my remarks, I will touch upon three topics. First, what are we doing to address the resident service issues? Second, what the future holds for the MHPI program, including ongoing challenges like maintaining aging homes and funding reductions? Third, what is necessary to ensure MHPI is a healthy, sustainable program that meets the housing needs of service members for many years to come? Together with our armed service partners, we have made significant improvements to how we operate, how we serve residents, and how we take care of homes. Our call centers are localized, our resident portal, portal excuse me, and mobile work order app allow multiple ways to track and submit service requests and provide feedback. In the month of January 2020, we received a resident satisfaction score of 93% on those work orders. We've also carefully reviewed all of our environmental, health, and safety policies, confirming that they meet industry standards. We are working closely with our partners and other MHPI participants to develop standardized policies and procedures across all of these areas. We have added more than 125 permanent positions focused on staying in touch with our residents and responding to service requests. Corbius fully supports all elements of the Tenant Bill of Rights, and we are committed to implementing all of them in conjunction with our military partners. Corbius recently spearheaded the first of its kind direct investment of private capital into our Army partnerships, injecting $325 million for construction and renovation work at no cost to the government. We are close to finalizing an additional $157 million to modernize even more homes. This effort will result in the improvement of nearly 18,000 homes across the portfolio. However, there is still much more work to be done. Without the right level of BH increases, the MHPI partnership's economic model gets out of balance, an untenable situation for delivering today's needs while saving for tomorrow's. The MHPI partnership's reinvestment reserves alone are insufficient to fully address immediate needs and without action and working together to enable innovative solutions, those needs will remain largely unaddressed and grow exponentially. It's important we work together to make it easier for the MHPI program to attract outside capital. Specifically, if OMB were to revert to its original scoring methodology for MHPI project financing, it would facilitate longer term debt and make it significantly easier to bring in additional non-government dollars. As the members know, a member of today's first panel is a plaintiff in a pending lawsuit that was recently filed against our partnership with the Army at Fort Meade. Therefore, I hope the members will understand that this hearing is not appropriate forum for any further discussion regarding matters that are part of the pending litigation, and that I will not be able to address those matters here today. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Mr. Guild. Thank you. Chairwoman Wasserman Schultz, Judge Carter, and members of the subcommittee. 
On behalf of Lincoln Military Housing, thank you for the opportunity to testify before your subcommittee today. My name is Jeff Guild. I have spent my life in service to our nation, first as a son of a retired Army officer growing up in pre-privatized military housing, then for 20 years as a Navy SEAL, and now I proudly continue that service as Vice President for Lincoln Military Housing. Our company welcomes this subcommittee's oversight of the Military Housing Privatization Initiative. We hope you share our view that despite recent challenges, the MHPI is a valuable program that has improved the overall quality of military housing compared to the DOD managed housing of the last century. The MHPI companies are a partnership between the branches of the armed forces and development co companies with experience in real estate management and the residential sector. Under the MHPI, these companies carry out the day-to-day -day tasks of building, maintaining, and improving military houses. Over the past few years, our company has listened carefully to the concerns some families have expressed about the quality of their housing. More than 1,200 LMH employees, like myself, are veterans, military spouses, or have service members in their families. We wake up every day to serve our resident families with honor and integrity. But it is obvious that some of our families feel we have come up short. <clears throat> our company has previously apologized to our mili military families for the times that we have failed to live up to expectations. And I re reiterate that sentiment again here today. Beginning in 2017 and working with military families and advocacy organizations, LMH undertook a holistic review of our policies and procedures to explore how we could improve. We identified, developed, and implemented several reforms to address two main goals. The first was to improve the quality of our homes and services, and the second goal was to make reforms that reestablish a culture of trust, transparency, and dialogue with our residents. I am pleased that as I sit here today, many reforms have been implemented. We are in the process of making further reforms, a number of which are being developed and implemented with our service branch partners consistent with the FY 2020 National Defense Authorization Act. Together with DOD, LMH is working as expeditiously as possible to put structure around the dozens of complex provisions in the privatized housing section of the NDAA. As your subcommittee examines how our PPVs are performing and what resources may be needed to carry out the NDAA, I look forward to working with you and our DOD partners to explore new and creative ways to improve our military families' experience in our housing. We understand that the issues are not just about fixing drywall, but repairing a culture of trust with our residents, a culture that recognizes the dignity of their service to our nation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gild. Mr. Ale? Chairman, Chairwoman Wasserman Schultz, Ranking Member Carter, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, good morning. My name is John Ale. I'm President of Hunt Military Communities. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. At Hunt, we are proud to serve America's military families. We are entrusted to build quality communities for them, and we take that responsibility very seriously. During the Senate hearing in February last year, it became clear to us that there were families living in our homes whose voices had not been heard. We lost their trust, we're sorry, and we want to get it right. We have heard our residents loud and clear. We are listening, and we are better for it. Over the past year, we have worked diligently on rebuilding the trust between Hunt and our residents and improving their living experience. First, we recognize that quality homes and resident services depend on open and regular communications with our residents. We need to hear from all of our military families to address their concerns. We have taken action to make it easier for our residents to communicate with us. Also, we appreciate that maintenance is a critical part of providing quality homes. Last year, it became clear to us that we had to improve and do better by our residents. While maintenance issues will inevitably arise, it is our goal to provide professional, transparent, and timely service. To achieve this goal, we have enhanced maintenance processes, added key positions, and improved training. Finally, we support reforms to ensure the long-term success of the MHPI program, such as the Resident Bill of Rights. We look forward to working together to provide a better experience for the men and women who protect this country. We are by no means perfect, and there have been times when we have fallen short of our residents' expectations. We are committed to rebuilding their trust in us. We have made progress over the past year, but our work is not done. Before I close, I do want to acknowledge the Gurdovich family represented here this morning. 
we greatly appreciate and respect Colonel Gerdovich's service and the sacrifices his family makes every day in defense of our country. Colonel Gerber? Gerdovich. Okay. Um, I listened to, to Ms. Gerdovich's testimony this morning. I was deeply disturbed by what I heard. No family should have to experience what was described this morning. Um, I will be directly uh, reviewing this case, and I'm committed to addressing the remaining concerns of the family. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me here to testify today. I look forward to engaging with you on this important topic and answering any questions you have. Thank you, Mr. Allen. I appreciate your comments um, about the Gertovich family. That's part of why we have these hearings, so that we can make sure that we can give voice to people who haven't had their voices heard. <clears throat> so I asked the first panel, um, whether they thought, an overarching question about whether they thought that privatizing military ha family housing was a good idea initially. And I'm going to assume, given that you all build military family housing, that the answer to that question from you is yes. Um, and that wouldn't be surprising because essentially the system was set up as a gravy train for each of your companies, um, for all of the companies that have benefited and put money, millions and millions of dollars in your pockets and profit. Um, nothing wrong with profit. But without, that, that occurred without a way for military families to hold you accountable because of the way the contracts are structured. It is outrageous and unacceptable, and all of your testimony is very nice now, but we should not be at this place. These are all, everything you've said today should have been the policies that you had in place to begin with. So if privatized housing was such a great idea, how and why could you let military ho family housing under this program become so dilapidated and neglected and then in turn not respond to the concerns and issues raised by families in a timely manner? It is our duty to provide for the service members and their families an optimal place to live no matter where they are stationed. And they already face enemies on behalf of this country. Their house should not be another enemy that they face. Deplorable housing conditions affect the readiness of a soldier and puts an additional stress on the families that remain behind. So I'd like to know how it is from each of you that we could be in this place and that you could have so badly neglected your responsibility to these residents. And we'll start with you, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, <clears throat> I guess, um, as I expressed in my opening remarks, you know, I've, I've come into this role okay. as a consequence of, of uh, the challenges that the industry has faced and, and what we personally have, have faced in, in this industry. And, uh, and so um, while I'm probably not the best person to, to respond to that in terms of how we got to where we are, what I can tell you is that when we recognize our shortcomings, we knew as, a, as an organization that we needed to act swiftly. Okay, Mr. Taylor, well, I hope you can answer that for question for the record. I, near, I realize you weren't there from when the ta the, during the time that these problems occurred, but if you could answer my question for the record, that would be great. Yeah. Um, another issue that I want to raise is that I find it shocking that someone on this panel would suggest that the solution to these problems that we increase the BAH. You took these contracts and you, and you decided to build military family housing knowing what the BAH was, knowing that there were, uh, knowing exactly what the, the formula was, and to come here and suggest that it's just that we're, you're, you're, our, our tenants aren't paying you enough money for you to be able to do right by them is, is really mind-blowing. We certainly do have to change the BAH, particularly because of the difference in cost of living where people live. But I hope you're not suggesting, Mr. Burleson, that that is what the solution is, is to put more money in your company's pocket. Madam Chair, no, ma'am. That is not what we're suggesting. What we are suggesting with the comment about BAH is in order to attract outside capital to significantly improve the housing stock and the aging infrastructure, we need to figure out some form of a stabilization of the BAH. We're not necessarily asking for additional BAH to come in. But in order to make it an attractive investment for the outside markets, we need to be able to figure out a way collectively to manage that BAH okay, but volatility. Pres but pres presumably, you are already bringing in enough resources to be able to take care of the problems and not ignore the residents as your company and other companies have done. Mr. Hickey, if you could answer my initial question, please. Thanks, Congresswoman. Um, yeah, I am of the view that the military privatisation initiative has been wildly successful. I think that it has delivered a lot of improvements right and across the board. how did we get to this point? I think at the end of the day, you know, in the context, as I said before, 
Um, we've got a percentage of residents that have not been heard and haven't had the structure to be able to be heard. And I think that what we need to do is to create a framework where those percentage of people who aren't it's happy... It's a pretty broad and large percentage. This is just not... Your, your, your testimony referenced tiny percentages, and that's not the evidence that newspaper articles and our rev oversight and the military itself have, have revealed. Yes, Congresswoman, I think that you know, we need to get back and we need to get to the real data of that. And I think at the end of the day, we, we actually are very focused on trying to improve that But why that weren't percentage. you responsive to residents' needs? We were needs. responsive to that. We need to get better at doing that. I Much think technology, better. Yeah, I think we acknowledge that and we've acknowledged that on several occasions that we need to get better at that and okay, we need to get better you. at technology and, Mr. and hearing. I think the way we got here, Madam Chair, is... Uh, collectively losing sight what was important. Uh, historically, I wasn't there, but understanding the way this, having lived in base housing pre-privatization and now being involved with it professionally post, I think there was a time when this first happened that everything was operating properly in the way it was supposed to. And I think what we've come to at this point is we've just collectively, us and our DOD partners, who I think would agree, have drifted away from the, the systems and the oversight that we had, and that's what we're working diligently with the DOD to improve and get back to through the NDAA and the Bill of Rights, and that's, that's what I, I appreciate endeavor. that acknowledgement, but the, if the companies just do the right thing and take care of the residents and have a system in place that is responsive, then DOD shouldn't really need to apply much oversight. There's, they should certainly be responsible, but your job is to be responsible. Thank you. Mr. Ayo. Chairwoman, there's certainly been cases where we've fallen short of expectations, and, and we're working to improve on those things. I would say that. But how did that happen? Uh, I mean, it, isn't it your natural responsibility as a company to take care of the residents who are your tenants? Yep. And, That's your and job. We've, and we've had locations that have been very successful at it, and some locations that haven't. And it so really was it is a lack of oversight on your on your admin, administration's part? What, what was it? Some of it is, is a people element. Where we've been successful, we've had really strong people on site. We've had really strong partnerships with commands and, and military housing offices, and we've had very good relationships with our, with our residents. And in the places where we have not been successful, we've, we've lacked those areas. We've had to look for lessons learned from, from the, those places where we are successful to implement them in places where we've not. And I would also say that, that the program is now 24 years old, and it is time to reform the program and, and make sure that it is poised <coughs> to be the success that it needs to be for the coming X number of years, and we are very supportive of the reforms that were outlined in the NDAA. Thank you. Just as my time expires, do a, a yes or no question from all of you. Do you support the full Tenants' Bill of Rights, adding the three elements of the Tenants' Bill of Rights that are not currently included? We do, Congresswoman. Okay. Yes. We do. We do. Yes, we do. Okay. Thank you. The challenges you're, you've been facing, oh, what, they, we heard a lot about water. Is, it, is there a design flaw somewhere that's causing all this mole infestation that everybody's, because of something that either the government said, these are the specs, and you put those specs in and they were wrong, or you, there's something wrong with your, what you did and it needs to be fixed and remediated. Have you looked at this, these problems, or are they way more than water? I can answer that uh, directly, um, Judge Carter. So the question is, uh, have we identified systemic issues with, with some of our properties? Uh, I can give you an example. Um, my area is Hampton Roads, Virginia, so mostly a, a Navy portfolio. And one of our neighborhoods, uh, Willoughby, about 385 units, um, as we were uh, having various issues with, with the houses usually involving around the ducts. As we opened them up, we identified that there was a, an installation flaw in the original HVAC system. So these properties were some of the uh, legacy properties that, that we inherited from the Navy and realized that every time we looked at one of these vents, essentially it was a gap between the ducting and, and the actual vent cover. We identified it. We made it a capital expenditure project. It's one that we're undergoing this year, so every time uh, a house comes offline, 
we, we do the capital expenditure project and uh, improve the house that way. So if that answers your question. Judge Carter, if I may, those stories abound. Um, so when we talk about the aging infrastructure and the need to uh, eliminate all of the older homes, it's partly for that very reason. Uh, that's not to say that we could not build a brand new home and still have some design issues and some design challenges. Uh, but the primary challenge that we've experienced is in that aging infrastructure. Judge Carter, <clears throat> similarly, I, I think, um, you know, probably the most prominent location that we had in our, have in our portfolio was at Tinker Air Force Base in, in Oklahoma. Um, and, and we had issues with new construction and the legacy homes. And, and the new con construction was down to a, a construction a, uh, product defect uh, that we had to remediate. And we, we remediated that at our cost. Um, and we are in litigation against the manufacturer of that product to, to try to seek restitution so that we can, we can uh, uh, you know, re, re, uh, reinvest those funds back into the project. On legacy homes, in that case, we found that we've had systemic issues with uh, aging HVAC infrastructure. And, uh, and we've committed to the Air Force to, to embark upon a, a plan to remediate all of those issues there. But those, that's just one example of one base where we've had issues on both new and legacy homes. Um, it's, it's not uh, consistent across all of our portfolio. Obviously, there are, there are some climates that are more, uh, that can promote uh, more mold growth because of the, the climate, you know, climate issues. Uh, and and, and uh, so where we have those, those issues, you know, we look, you know, if we have incidences of mold, we look for uh, a, a pattern of any systemic issues that, that could be a deeper seated issue that we need to address. Yeah, thanks, Judge Carter. Um, I won't reiterate what's already been spoken, but obviously it's a combination of ageing inventory, climate conditions, et cetera. I mean, we have a regime that's very clearly communicated at time of move in, move out, that if any resident, for whatever reason, distinguishes mould in the house, to call us and we respond within 24 hours. To give you some sort of context, of our 400,000 service orders, less than 1%, 0.7% relate to mould, lead-based paint or asbestos in there. So we try to address it. Some of it is aged inventory, some of it is you know, mechanical, as some of the members have said here, but you know, it requires the investment, it requires us to turn to try and be more proactive in managing that. But now lead-based paint would be old homes, not new homes. Correct, Surely you're not correct. No, that's pre-1979. I was just saying across lead-based paint and asbestos <laughs> and mould, less than 0.7% of our service orders are into that back bucket. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Carter. Mr. Case. Um, privatized housing for our military and their families is not just a straight business proposition because this is a lot more than that. It's about the health and well-being of our families and our service members. But I want to talk from a business perspective here for a second to understand um, the underlying um, issues. And so the basic deal here is um, that um, you all um, have an income stream. The income stream is a BAH, dedicated income stream. Um, and in return for that income stream, you're responsible for, for, for providing housing, which means that you have an administration cost. You have a, also a repair and maintenance obligation. You're supposed to take care of the premises, and then you get your profit. Is that about the deal? Yes. OK. Now, um, and, and furthermore, to make sure, as I recall, to make sure that uh, you basically didn't skimp on the R&M side of it, the repair and maintenance side of it, we have the reinvestment accounts, which are supposed to be dedicated to repair and maintenance, right? Now, Mr. Burleson, you've, you've spent a fair bit of time talking about those reinvestment accounts, and others of you indirectly referenced to them. Um, you talked about, you know, uh, what was the quote? Leveraging the uh, reinvestment account deposits. Uh, you talked about uh, long-term debt. Uh, you talked about um, changing the formula under which uh, the reinvestment accounts are administered. To me, that sounds like a concern over the sufficiency of the reinvestment accounts to take care of sufficient repair and maintenance. Um, and I'm going to go back to the point of the chair, which is, do you believe that those R&M accounts are deficient from the perspective of what you found 10, 20 years later, in terms of your R&M obligations, um, uh, for whatever reason, and if so, why? And uh, I'm going to ask you the same question again. Uh, were, the, were the projections of where the BAH was going to go over the term of this contract, which is obviously very long contracts, did that turn out to be 
short. So the, the fundamental question I've got here is, um, in the business deal as it exists right now, do you have enough or are you dedicating enough under your contracts to R&M? This is a basic business proposition and if so, um, should those contracts be changed uh, either by renegotiations or by some action by Congress? Congressman, there's a lot there to that question. Um, do you have enough in your reinvestment accounts to take care of sufficient repair and maintenance as you project it over time? In order to maintain where we are today, I believe we do, and I, I will let the rest of the panelists uh, share their own individual perspectives. Um, the challenge is, is these homes are continuing to get older and older day by day. And so in order to make some significant and meaningful impacts, we need to deploy as much capital into those homes as we can today, rather than waiting another 5, 10, 15 years through the traditional reinvestment reserve account. That's the reason we move forward in conjunction with the Army Secretariat to inject the $325 million into the deals. To answer your previous question, or your other question, Congressman, the, the deals did work on paper when we closed them, you know, 15, 20 years ago. There's been a lot of changes, there's been a lot of evolutions. Some of the BAH projections did not come to fruition. Some other challenges, such as occupancy, uh, expenses, and inflation, some of those things did not come to bear as we had initially projected within the pro formas. Uh, we are in earnest right now digging back into each one of the individual project companies' pro formas and determining where are those challenges and what we need to do to overcome them. Okay, does any of you um, have a, kind of a, a, an overall different answer because I'm focusing on these reinvestment accounts and sufficiency over time? Is that, is that the situation that you all faced was at the initial projections? Um, uh, really didn't work out at, over time for, for various reasons. Congressman, I'd, I'd say from our perspective, I mean, we've got uh, 55 different military installations where, where we have a presence, <clears throat> and, and it's not a universal um, uh, story at, at all of those. There are some projects that are far more financially healthy when we look at the reinvestment accounts. There are some installations where, we've, where, where we are going to struggle uh, at, at the current pace. And I'm sorry, can I ask you on that question, is the difference, does, is the difference the, you talked about vacancy, which I assume means whether uh, families are electing to go outside rather than stay in, or is, or, and or is that about um, misassessments of R&M obligations over time? I, I, I think that it's less that, because we- The latter. Less, less us, um, missing what, what the projections w were to look like. I think there are a lot of other issues that have contributed to this, and, and, it, and it's locale specific. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned in my opening remarks was the need for BAH rate civil stabilization. When we closed almost every one of these projects, we were at, at a period where we had zero out of pocket as a result of, of uh, Secretary Cohen's initiative to reduce that out of pocket exposure for military families on base and off base to zero. So that was the baseline from which we originally projected these projects were going to operate. Subsequent to that, we've seen BH drop. Um, so we, we projected that, you know, from that baseline, we would see moderate growth, 2 to 3% a year, typically, for, for every project. And, and in many cases, we saw the opposite happen. So that we can't ignore the fact that that's had an impact. That's strained uh, the financial health of projects when you have less income than what was originally projected. That's been a contributing factor. Uh, on the operating expense side, We've seen increases in utilities far greater than in some locations than, than what we could have projected or anticipated. There are many places, if you look at where, where we're situated, we've been exposed to natural disasters that have, that have further, that exacerbated the financial health of some of the projects. Probably the no, most no, worthy one for us was at Tyndall Air Force Base that effectively wiped out the base a couple of years ago. And those, those are things that, that have a meaningful impact on, on projects. And, uh, and so again, I think that those are things that we can't ignore um, so I think if we're, if we're going to look at, you know, the long-term health of this project, I think the first thing we need to fix is the income stream, make it far more predictable. Um, and then, you know, we, we, need, we need the ability to kind of return to the old OMB scoring model so that we can go out and leverage additional capital because that is exactly where many of these projects are, are going to need to go. Okay, I'm, my time's up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Case. Mr. Rutherford. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Burleson, you mentioned the 97% satisfaction rate. Um, all of you as businessmen know that data 
if, if you got bad data, you got bad results. And I think a lot of what's going on here is we've got bad data. The GAO says, in response to your 3% disapproval or dissatisfaction rate, says that DOD provides reports to Congress on the status of privatized housing, but some data in these reports are unreliable, leading to misleading results. DOD provides periodic reports to Congress on the status of privatized housing, but reported results on resident satisfaction are unreliable due to variances in the data provided to OSD by the military departments and in how OSD has calculated and reported this data. Interestingly, when in, in the actual report, they say that you assume that the resident is satisfied if they're still living in the residence. Because if they weren't satisfied, they'd move out. But we also know that it, they can't move out because they're going to continue to pay for it, the BAH, whether they're there or not. How, how do you use that kind of data to decide satisfaction? Congressman, I, with all due respect, the 97 percent, I believe, was shared by another panelist. We were at 93 percent. So, okay. But nevertheless, I, 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 the still, points the, yeah. I still get the point. I got you. The point remains. Okay. Uh, so the, the challenge is, uh, <clears throat> and the challenge has been, I believe some of the data has been accurate, um, but I believe that the overall sentiments um, have not been thoroughly expressed. Um, taken back to the Army survey, just for example, 2019, the spring Army survey of 2019, uh, we had the lowest <clears throat> response rates across our Army portfolio, roughly 15% response rates, where I believe the average was roughly in the 30% range, if not maybe a little bit higher. Um, we took that information and we took the feedback to heart that each of the residents, uh, that 15%, that the information that they were sharing, it was heartfelt. They, they really took the time to let us know what the challenges were. And Congressman, with all due respect, there, there were a lot of challenges. And we have been working in earnest as hard as we can to, to meaningfully overcome those challenges. And I believe we're on the right path, but we're not there yet. There's plenty more to be done. And that's not a sound bite. That's, but that's let, let me give you another matrix that I think you need to look at. Military, military departments use performance matrix to monitor private partners, but matrix do not provide meaningful information on conditions of housing. And here's an example. A common indicator is that when, when they're looking at the condition of housing and the response to maintenance, a common indicator is how quickly the private partner responded to the work order, not whether the issue was ever actually fixed. What, so you guys need to go back and look at how you're measuring things. So Congressman, we are. Um, with respect, we are doing that. Um, matter of fact, just in the first two months of 2020, our work order satisfaction, as soon as the work, let me take another step back, as soon as a work order is completed, we send a survey to the family asking them if they are satisfied uh, with the work that was performed, if it was done to their satisfaction. Uh, the first two months of 2020, we have seen the highest average that we have over the past four or five years. It was at a almost all-time low this time last year, quite frankly, and we've seen a steady increase. So it is something that we are working hard to overcome. You mentioned also that one of the, one of the challenges has been occupancy. Well, no wonder. When you, when you look at these numbers, and, and if you're getting numbers at HQ that's telling you 97% are satisfied or 93%, whatever number you want to use, um, you're fooling yourselves. And that, that's impacting on your occupancy. And, and so, you know, I, I, I want to encourage all, all of you, go back and look at how you're measuring this stuff. Because according to GAO, you're not measuring very well. And it, it's, uh, you know, your, your tenants are, are paying for it. Congressman, can I, can I ask, uh, offer a comment there? Mr. Taylor? The, the, uh, <clears throat> the original incentive criteria that, that were set out in, in all of our agreements was a construct that was developed when we, when we closed on, on the projects. And, and there was a heavy focus on responsiveness to, 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 to uh, work, work requests, less of a focus on quality and completeness. And, and we are constantly meeting with our, our, our military partners. And I can tell you that there's a revision across all of the services to put more focus on resident satisfaction, 
quality and completeness of work, focus on preventive maintenance so that we can address things before they ever become an issue. So the, we're, we get it. And you've we're been measuring it. all and, those things, Mr. Taylor. Yes, sir. You've been measuring all those things. Uh, you've just been wrong. There's, been a, there's going to be a greater focus. Like, as okay. I said, the, the, the incentive criteria are all being revised effective this, this year, and, and we are all signing up to that. Good. And, and I'm really glad to hear that all of you, that, now I know you can't speak for everybody, but is it, is it pretty much all 14 private partners believe that um, we, we need to put those three omissions in the Tenant Bill of Rights? Because I, I, I think that's uh, necessary. Uh, you, you know, the, uh, I can list them for you. The access to maintenance history of the home, a process for dispute resolution, and the ability to withhold rent. Th those three things, and, and I think all of you answered the Congresswoman, uh, Chairwoman, yes, correct? What, what, it, the, and the rest of the industry is uh, on board as well, or? Uh, I think we have Yeah. Okay, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Rutherford. Um, Mr. Ryan. Thank you, Chairwoman. You know, we're, we're kind of on the front lines, too, here because we get the calls. And the sense I'm getting from the people behind you is that your responses aren't adequate. And I will just say, just listening to your opening statement, I think the gentleman at the end was the only one who really said, we failed and we want to do better and we screwed up and you know when you sit on this side and we have to go through excruciating analysis of how we spend the taxpayers money and what we spend it on and we spend it on post-traumatic stress we spend it on mental health opiates trying to make sure that people who work in the VA have the training that they need to deal with these uh, situations that we have had to deal with for the last 20 years. And, and we have to get calls after spending our time back in our districts talking to these veterans who walk around without legs, uh, people who serve our country in far-flung places that most people don't even know where they are. And, and we have got to hear stories like the one you know we're hearing, the ones we're hearing, uh, it's maddening us. And I'm extremely disappointed because you, you guys do pretty well. There's four billion dollars that goes out the door for this, and we've got our soldiers living with, with mold, uh, exposing their children. Uh, un completely unacceptable. Um, and you know, I know there's different scenarios. I, I'd like to just drill down for a couple of minutes on, because I try to picture myself, we got three kids. I try to picture myself living in one of these homes with the 17-year-old, 16-year-old, and 5-year-old, and calling somebody and saying, we have mold in our home and nothing happening. And so, Mr. Burleson, I know there's an issue with, that's been public with the lawsuits and different things about families who are living in these uh, situations with sewage and mold and lead-based paint and all the, the rest. When I call somebody in this particular scenario, who do I call and what's their response? Because every one of you said, well, we've got an app now, which is like the answer for everything in America to fix a problem. Well, we've got an app. I call somebody, I'm a dad, I call somebody. Who do I call in this scenario and what happened? Where was the breakdown? Congressman, you would call our, one of our community offices and one of our resident service specialists would take the information, immediately put it into the system and based upon the severity of the challenge within the home, um, there's a certain timeline is established for the team to respond and they come to your home, do an assessment, evaluate, and we openly communicate what those right next steps are. With all due respect, that's what we're doing today, and that's what we should have been doing all along, and we were doing it at various levels. We had some team members that didn't have the right level of focus, some team members that didn't have the right level of training, and a lot of those folks are no longer with us, quite frankly. So we have put a brand new focus, a renewed focus, 
on making sure that the teams are trained and we have really gotten back to that customer centric approach uh, that we take a lot of pride in. The taxpayer wants to know how how this has been going on so long and you're just coming around and saying well we fixed it like what what happened? Congressman, I'm not saying we fixed it. I'm saying we are in the process. Well, you have a process now in place that's like, wait, when someone, when that dad or that mom called that person, what the hell happened? What did they do with that information? I have mold. I have kids. I'm giving it to your community rep. What happened? What did they do? Did they go out for a cigarette break and it lost the paper? I mean, what happened? They're supposed to call somebody, right, to come fix it. And they didn't. They just didn't call somebody. Like I'm. I'm trying to work with you here. No, Help I, me I, understand what I, happened. I understand and I appreciate that. I, th I think in some cases, uh, residents' concerns and residents' issues and challenges were not taken as serious as they should have been. And I think that's the bottom line. And it's so it's you're telling you're telling us that you had people working for you, and this is across the board. I'm, ta I'm pinpointing you on this particular issue because we only got five minutes and gets dispersed if we get too too uh, broad, but. You're telling me that someone called about mold in their home and you had an employee who didn't do anything about it, just flat out said, this is not a major concern, this is not a major health concern, and I'm going to move on with my day? I believe in some cases that probably occurred. How does that happen? I, I, I do not know how that happened. I don't know how that happened. It's unacceptable. Um, I do know that there are a lot of challenges that exist. I do know that we have addressed a lot of the concerns and the challenges prior to some of the hearings that occurred last year, the hearing in February. Um, we did have a focus, but I don't think that the focus was at the right level. See, I, I'm, just, I'm just thinking about, because, you know, everybody loves this privatize, privatize, see it in the schools, and, you know, people are getting paid, and schools stink. You know, it doesn't matter. There's no accountability, most part. Um, like, how would you survive in the private sector, like, without the government contracts? Who would go, who would, who, this story spread around Youngstown, Ohio, and the, it was just straight people pulling money out of their paycheck to go pay for rent or whatever. You wouldn't make it. And, and, and that's what's frustrating, is that the argument is we're going to privatize this thing and it's all going to work just beautifully because the government can't do anything right. And so we're going to give it to you folks, you fellas, and... Make it right. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Appreciate your, uh, your questions. Ms. Roby. Thank the chairwoman. And I'm going to direct my questions to Mr. Brolson from Corvius and Mr. L from Hunt, uh, since they are contractors for Fort Rucker and Maxwell Air Force Base, um, both of which are in my district. And look, I think you're hearing very loud and clear uh, the frustrations coming out of my colleagues, um, I share a lot of their sentiment, uh, if not all, and um, I think that's been well established here today. Um, I forgot to push start on my timer, so <laughs> okay. Um, we don't have the lights in here. It makes it very frustrating. And look, in your testimony, you both acknowledge that you've fallen short um, in meeting residents' expectations. Uh, but you've also made changes to uh, improve the quality, I'm told. So I want to give you an opportunity um, to talk about the additional steps moving forward. I think, again, it's been well established here today through members questioning and, and testimony where we've fallen short. Um, but I think it's important for us to have a productive conversation on what it looks like moving forward so that you can help it, my constituents and others that are here present today um, to know what steps are being taken, specific steps are being taken, and what does Congress need to do to m ensure that we don't find ourselves sitting in this room having a similar conversation uh, again. So I'm going to let divide the time between the two of you th that's remaining and, and give you that opportunity. Okay. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, you know, we've, we've, again, support the reforms that are outlined in the NDAA and all of the elements of the re re Resident Bill of Rights. The three elements that, that have not yet been included, and I emphasize the word yet, because they have been under, um, under development for months. 
uh, and and are and mostly almost done. So it is the intent to put those into the resident bill of rights, and we support that. All of the to to um, somewhat respond to uh, the question earlier. Um, Again, we can't speak for the other project owners that aren't here, but I can say that, that all 14 project owners have been putting in their input on those elements of the real Bill of Rights. So uh, I, I think we're almost there. Um, so I think there is round support for it. And, um, and I, th I think with, with the implementation of the NDA elements, which is taking some time because some of them are pretty big, uh, I think those are going to have significant impacts in 2020. But it, while all that's been going on at Hunt, we've been working on internal reforms of things we can control, um, things like uh, um, work order consistency across the portfolio. Over 10 to 15 years of, of closing projects, the documents would evolve a little bit. We wouldn't be using the same set of documents over and over again, and they would vary from service to service. And so there would be variances in, in how work orders were taken out, um, what the definition of a response or incompletion was, and those sorts of things. At Hunt, we established a Hunt standard where we've we've standardized across all of our properties, regardless of service or, or age, to pick out the the most stringent elements of of our facilities maintenance plans, management plans, and apply that across our portfolio for consistency from location to location, and 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 improving accountability from top down because we've now more clearly defined our, our corporate values for our employees and have in, will be incorporating them into. Uh, um, performance uh, re reviews all the way from the top down so that those values are being carried out to deliver the, a, a more clearly defined level of what we call five-star service. Thank you. Congresswoman, uh, thank you for the question. We've done a lot. Um, there's been a lot of what we refer to as the basics blocking, basic blocking and tackling of customer service that we'd allowed ourselves to get away from. Um, some things that sound so simple and so fundamental, I answered the question earlier that what would happen if, uh, if a dad called in about a mold concern. And I said they would call the community center and receive a RSS that, that is an employee. That's absolutely what will happen today. However, over the past couple of years, that didn't happen. What would happen is if a customer called with a complaint during business hours, it went to a call center. And that call center then routed the information that eventually came back to us. The information could have not been taken down accurately. There could have been some other communication challenges. But we, we noticed really quick uh, in late 2018, early 2019, that that just wasn't a customer-focused opportunity for us to truly engage with the resident. So all of our call centers, excuse me, all of uh, the call centers have gone away during business hours. So if you have a concern, you're actually able to talk to one of our employees to work through the challenge. That's just one example of that blocking and tackling that we've gotten back to in the basics. Um, as Mr. Ill said, uh, we also fully support, and I've also said uh, previously, we fully support uh, the Resident Bill of Rights and the three additional provisions within the NDAA that did not make it to the Bill of Rights, I think those things are going to help. And I think it's a continued push for all of us and a continued focus for all of us. Uh, Congresswoman, you asked the question also, what, what can you do? What can you do to help? Um, while I don't necessarily enjoy sitting here, um, I do think this is a help. I, I think it's a big help. I think uh, the more attention we can focus in on the, what the true issues are and where the true challenges lie and continue to shine the light where those are so we can all work together to overcome them, I think is really important. My time is up, but I would just maybe leave you with this. I mean, I, I think what I've heard you say um, in the short time that I've been sitting here, and I apologize for jumping in and out, but... Um, there are places where it is working and there are places that that have woefully fallen short. And I just, I think sometimes, you know, these things is, it can, we can be over analytical when, when we could just take the model of where it's working and then apply that elsewhere. And I, it's not rocket science. It's, it's people's lives and their, their quality of life um, and we're talking about our, our service members, families that are already sacrificing so much. And um, at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. But it seems to me, Madam Chair, that it, in Congress's oversight on these issues where it is working, um, we need to take those that model and apply it across the board. And um, I, I know it probably is not that simple, but it seems to me we could take best practices and, and amplify that 
but I do appreciate you being here. And like you said, it's probably not a very comfortable chair to be sitting in right now, but it's important for us to have this opportunity to ask you guys these, these questions to ensure that we're we're doing our part as members of Congress. And I appreciate you having this hearing today. And Thank I you, Ms. Roby. over my time. I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Roby. And um, it is that simple. It, yeah, it really is. Mr. Cartwright. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, gentlemen, thanks for coming in today. Um, w we've talked about the, um, the Tenants' Bill of Rights. Uh, some of you have referred to it as a Residence Bill of Rights. Uh, Mr. Burleson, I thank you for mentioning that there were things that, got, that didn't get included in the, the latest version of the Bill of Rights that you support. And, um, and I want to I touch on those things now. And uh, what, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to, Mr. Taylor, if you would pass these out. Uh, um, we made a list of the things that uh, that didn't make it in, and um, uh, for the record, we're showing a poster uh, of uh, seven items, and um, I would ask unanimous consent that this uh, this handout be uh, entered into the record. Without objection. <clears throat> a week ago, in response to the directives of this subcommittee and the uh, Fiscal Year 2020 National Defense Authorization Act, Defense Secretary Esper uh, and the Service Branch Secretaries all signed a privatized Military Housing Tenants Bill of Rights, left off, as we've been discussing, uh, Secretary Esper's list were the following, uh, which were included in the Bill of Rights uh, directive in the NDAA that we passed. Uh, the first three uh, uh, are, are listed. Uh, the right to receive a maintenance history on a property before signing a lease. Uh, the uh, Second, the right under certain circumstances to enter into a voluntary dispute resolution process that may reduce rent. And number three, the right to have housing payments held in escrow pending such a dispute resolution. Um, it, uh, d d would you all be all right with all of those? R let the record reflect that uh, uh, everyone said yes. Did you too, Mr. Gill? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, and, and then um, also left off of Secretary Esper's list were several other key tenant protections included in the, included in the bill text of the NDAA that we passed, and four of those other protections were a requirement that military housing privatization initiative, MHPI, management companies like you, reimburse DOD for tenants' medical costs if the companies fail to maintain safe and sanitary conditions in the housing that they manage, and you see that. Number two, uh, number two, a requirement that MHPI companies like you pay reasonable relocation costs if relocation becomes necessary because of health or environmental hazards. Number three, a mechanism where DOD will withhold incentive fees to the MHPI companies if they fail to remedy health or environmental hazards. And number four, a prohibition of collecting amounts in addition to rent by the MHPI companies other than for amenities, damages, and non-essential utilities. And these are all spelled out in the, the handout. Uh, do you all agree to those as well? That's in the text of the, of the NDAA. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, Congressman, um, thanks for the opportunity to talk about this. I think generally, as they're written here, high level, we agree with. I think the first issue around medical costs requires a lot more detailed implementation process around that because, you know, it's in how this is implemented rather than a single sentence. So the other things we, we agree to these. It's just it's the next level of implementation around who's qualified to make that determination, how is that determination made, where does the information come from. It's all of those things that we are working through. But you agree with the language. We agree with the intent. Yes. Okay. And Mr. Taylor. Yeah. And I'll just add to, to Mr. Hickey's comments. Um, all of these issues all are issues that we are in constant dialogue with, uh, with uh, Department of Defense officials um, to sort through what that process looks like. 
um, because having the language there is, is, is important. But what's important for us in our partnership is, is determining what's the process that we need to take to embed these into our agreements. And, and th that dialogue is, is, going, is ongoing with all 14 project owners. Right, that's process, but you agree Sorry. with the, the, yes, the intent and the language, right? Yes, sir. All right. Well, thank you, uh, and, and I'm here to tell you, know that this subcommittee, through its continued oversight, uh, will for every remaining year of your 50-year management contracts hold you to these commitments. You understand that, right? Okay. I want to talk about NDAs just for a moment. Um, the, um, you can put the poster down. Um, a March 29, 2019 task and purpose online news article included a copy of an NDA, non-disclosure agreement, apparently used for the settlement of a base housing tenant claim by Lincoln Military Housing. Um, the NDA was reportedly presented to a, a resident at Camp Pendleton Marine Corps Base. The agreement read in part, and I'm going to pass this out, and I'd like uh, a unanimous consent to enter this into the record as well. Without objection. Hey, if you pass that out and make sure Mr. Guild gets a copy. Um, it says, residents agree that they will not file or institute any complaint or demand against Lincoln Property Company, Pendleton Quantico Property Management, or in any way participate in the prosecution of any complaint or grievance against Lincoln Property Company in any agency or other forum concerning any allegation covered by this agreement. Residents further agree they will keep the existence of this agreement and its terms and other information concerning its strict, strictly confidential. Residents shall at all times refrain from making any negative, adverse, or disparaging remarks, whether oral or written, and including all internet and social media concerning the residents or, uh, or any non-disclosure agreement. Um, and, uh, well, Mr. Guild, uh, do you currently use NDAs for the resolution of landlord-tenant disputes that were never actually litigated, but that do relate to health and safety issues in base housing? Uh, I can't speak to what issues, but we have used NDAs, and we've used um, for, <clears throat> for mediation with, with tenants. Uh, the rest of you, is that also true? Do you use N NDAs for uh, uh, disputes that were never actually litigated? Uh, no, Congressman, we, we have used confidentiality agreements on things that are being litigated, right. but only for those matters. Okay, the rest of you? Congressman, we do not use NDAs. Okay. Nor do we, sir. Trailer? In the customary sense that, that they tend to get used in financial settlements for protection of both parties, we have an occasion in the past. I'm talking about non-litigated non matters. You have, okay? Um, do you know? Okay. <coughs> Will NDAs for non-litigated matters be used with tenants during the execution of the remainder of your housing property management contract with the Department of Defense? In other words, going forward, you're going to continue to use these things? We haven't used them to date. We won't use them going forward. Okay. We, we will comply with, with uh, the terms that are spelled out in the NDAA regarding NDAs. We will as well. We'll comply with the NDAA. We will comply with the NDAA. But you're going to continue to use them. And, and boys, you understand my concern here. It's transparency. When something comes up, somebody, some dad has mold in the family ha uh, base housing, privatized housing, and, and some, uh, there's a resolution without, a, without litigation. Would the gentleman yield Yeah, I will for yield. a question? Yes. Does the NDAA now prohibit NDAs? Since we're using the same letters, I just want to make sure that I have clarity on the question. Prohibits them with just the regular lease, but allows them in a I'm sorry, I think you probably have to come to a mic and answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the the NDA right now prohibits them uh, ex explicitly for just a regular lease, signing a lease, going into the agreement. 
But it does allow them if the matter is in the courts and you bring it out of the courts with a settlement. Right. Okay, so maybe, Mr. Cartwright, you could revise your question so that we understand if they're going to use NDAs not, that are not prohibited by the NDAA right. going that, forward. And that is the question. You're going to use them where they're, where they're not prohibited? Uh, Mr. Cartwright, I just wanted to, uh, to clarify that we're, we're not using these going forward regardless of the NDAA. And I'm glad to hear that because here's a concern. When, when some Mr. Cartwright, would you mind if every one of them answers that question, please? Pardon me? Would you mind if all the companies ask, answer that question? Yeah, please go ahead, each of you. We're not prohibited. Uh, we, we may have occasion to because I understand that there is protections for both parties involved. And it is, there is legal custom, custom to use them on occasion. Congressman, we do not intend to use NDAs, nor have we in the past. Right. You said that. Congressman, we do not use NDAs other than for a litigation settlement. We said that we won't use it going forward. Right. And we have a similar view, and, and, and any time that one would be contemplated, we, we would always do so with the, uh, the agreement of our military partner. Here's my concern, is that we need transparency. We have to have tra transparency. If, if, if a little extra compensation is given so that you can get an NDA, that's not protecting both parties, Mr. Ailey. That's protecting the privatized housing company. And it's, and it's going to hurt the people who need to know about the mold or the infestation or the paint chips or whatever is wrong that led to the dispute in the first place. That's what I'm talking about. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, and thank you for your indulgence in me helping you ask questions. <laughs> we tag teamed the last, the last couple. Um, this entire panel has really been eye-opening um, and added to my concerns rather than alleviating them. Um, it just shows me, and I think our colleagues, that we have more work to do. Um, we certainly will be taking a look as we prepare the, the chairwoman's mark for this fiscal year, what we can include to make sure that we ensure that there is more oversight and accountability and that we um, don't just trust you because words talk is cheap. I'm a, I'm a show me person, not a tell me person. And so we're going to make you show us. And we'll work with our partners on the Armed Services Committee because it seems like the NDAA, the next time we do the NDAA, it probably needs to go a little further in, in the kind of NDAs that we prohibit. So, gentlemen, you all have work to do. Um, thank you for your testimony and appearing before this panel. Um, we look forward to continuing the dialogue with you and uh, having you uh, update us on the implementation of your improving dramatically not only the conditions of the facilities that you run, but the responsiveness that you provide to our military families because they deserve nothing less. So with that, We'll allow for a few minutes to switch out the witness panels and the subcommittee will stand in recess briefly for that purpose.